Okay, guys. So, uh, as you see, I posted all the lectures online. I also gave you the material. We are looking for the labs, um, uh, 3 and 5th, October. And then we'll also have a TEM lab um, soon arranged for you. Um, now, uh, I think I stopped last time here on the quick summary of FIB uh, before the practical session uh, that we are having on October. Um, I'll quickly uh, revise what we went through. So, as I told you, FIB has a very similar technology as of SIMS. Uh, and SIMS stands for secondary ion mass uh, spectroscopy. And the simple thing that we are doing is we are using a very high focused ion beam to mill your sample. And this high focused ion beam is attached to your um, SEM. Uh, as through SEM, you are looking to your sample and through focused ion beam, you are sputtering your material. So overall, um, this is what we are doing. Just sputtering a material with a focused ion beam and looking through a electron gun. Um, schematics looks like that. I think I'll, I'll go a little bit faster through that because I went last time. Now, in the focused ion beam, uh, what you see is that this is your sample stage. And this sample stage here is basically that's what's intended. If you make it absolutely parallel to the ground the stage, you will be absolutely perpendicular to the SEM and you would be able to have a clear view. As soon as you want to do FIB, you want to tilt the sample holder towards the FIB gun. This is the gun that will be used to sputter your sample. As I explained last time, what we are doing is from a very thick sample, we are going to a 100 nanometer layer. And then the third thing that we have is GIS. And this GIS is actually a multifunctional gun by which you can literally have four, uh, four different kinds of ions that we, uh, that we do. So number one, we use platinum to GIS, we can select. Then we will use nitrogen. Uh, it is something that is very important um, thing that we uh, put in our material while you know, uh, doing FIB. As you see on the diagram here, uh, when you do FIB alone versus FIB plus GIS, what do you see? You see that GIS, I would mean that I would put nitrogen on, right? And you see the etching is fast. So overall, these are the three things. And then is the electron detectors, right? This was the overall uh, FIB that you would be doing. You would be playing with these four things again and again. You would be inserting different GIS. You would be choosing different um, current of ions and different energy of ions, depending on the need of your sample. Then SEM would just uh, act as a microscope to look at the entire procedure. And then we have detectors, right? Now, this is how it looked like, the entire procedure. You will just go look at your sample. How many of you have experience of using SEM? Wow, well done. How about you, Tommy? Not exactly. Okay, okay. Um, right, so uh, I think uh, we have to train you then. Um, and who knows SEM operation at GIM? Well done. So in the first lab of FIB, maybe I do not have anyone with me. So one of you can help me inserting the sample, showing it to the class. That should be okay. Yeah, cool. So now this is what you are looking. You are simply, um, I can just take it as an example. Um, if this is if this is your sample like this, you are looking at it like that under the microscope. You just put it on the sample uh, sample holder. And now you are, when, you, when it is like this, you are just simply looking at the surface of your sample. Now at certain surface here, you will uh, see, okay, these are holes and I want to examine them. You simply target it under the microscope and start tilting it so that it becomes, as I shown you in the previous slide, you know, in alignment with the FID gun. And now what you do here is this thing. 
you know the zone, right? You know the zone that you want to analyze? You start depositing platinum like this. And once you have deposited the platinum, idea is to check a small, um, small you know, very thin kind of a, exactly like a paper would come up, like a transfer slip. So this is the same thing that you will do from here. And to do that, you have to definitely create holes and try to make this region free from connection to either of the sides. So that's what you're doing step by step. But we are operating at a micron level, so you would be very careful. And it's something, a procedure, which is at a, uh, that you do with the needles. Now here you deposit the platinum and you keep the thickness of this platinum uh, enough so that it protects your material. I would be helping you with the exact numbers during the lab. Um, now you start uh, trying to somehow, you want that under, underneath this platinum, uh, whatever the material is, you are able to take it out. To do that, what you do, you create two grooves. And for that, you use a very high gun, why very high energy gun. And what you do is constantly taking your sample while, exam while taking it out. You're keeping it. This is what you see. Is earlier it was a flat, you have filtered it. And you're seeing these groups. And you see that how deep is the sample. If you don't see them while tilting, that means it's still connected. If it's still connected at the bottom, you go for a more deeper trench. And it's like beginning, it looks tough, but till here, till the step four, it's very easy. Uh, you just create two groups. And now you see that in this one, you start de uh, you start disconnecting it from the bottom, right? The, your, your little uh, sample. Now you start disconnecting it, so it becomes like this. And now what you do, I this is not shown here, but this is now ready to be taken out. I still connected, it is still connected at one place. So what I'll do is I'll bring the needle. I'll connect my material with the needle. That's why it is left here. Otherwise, how would it remain connected at this place, right? So I'll bring my needle, put, connect it to it, and then I will start making a trench here and disconnect it from the bulk sample. And this is how your sample looks like. And this is the zoom of your FID here. So here are some things. Um, I reflected a lot um, during uh, with some of the professors on how to bring this class very effectively. Um, they all emphasized on giving you a very small homework on the ray diagrams, uh, all the ray diagrams that I'm discussing, because I think that is the, that is the real soul of your uh, work. And you would be looking at it while, while you take TEM, um, while you, you know, uh, do your TEM uh, uh, practical exercise. On top of that, I, I don't think so you would need anything from FIB. Some homework would be coming. But a practical experience uh, would make you very, uh, you know, uh, perfect into it. So I don't expect a homework, but still good for your knowledge. Homework would be from Ray Diagram, so careful on that. So... Uh, this is uh, here, we are using electron beam and ion beam that we use is a gallium ion, right? Now we are using uh, three dimensions, uh, we can do it in X, Y, and Z, so that's why your sample holder can tilt in all directions, and you know why in the previous slide you saw we need it, we need to tilt it to see uh, where it is disconnected, and now uh, FIB, it provides you the view of Y and Z direction. So this is your FIB. So you can use gallium ion also to see your sample. But it won't be that clear. Now, why, why your FIB is a superior technique than any other conventional technique? Today we were discussing a group meeting that we use. Hold on. We use what do you call extra polishing? Why do you think idea is finally to make a very thin sample, make it electron transparent? So, what is the idea behind um, 
behind using FID? Number one reason. He says the iron goes at a fixed distance in the material. Another reason is a lot faster. Any other thing? Okay. Can de definitely choose your desired grain in SEM. And we can try to take a sample out of it. Could be oriented in one O axis, one O one axis, or one 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 axis. How, however, you want. The top reason, however, nobody said. Why do we prefer using FIB over electro polishing? Was your mechanical polishing? Okay. So the number one reason is because I would like to write because you keep this as notes with you. So the number uh, one reason that we have, you have your sample like this, right? It's a full sample like this. And what do you do? When you do any mechanical polishing, you are damaging this entire sample, isn't it? I would have to put the sample on a polishing machine, right? And then slowly this entire sample would be grinded, right? This entire thing would be grinded into a small thin thing. It's simply, a, you do a, any polishing, you're simply grinding it with, so what did you lose? Your entire sample. What can you do now? Nothing, right? That's the top reason why people started using FIB. It's a non-descriptive technique, right? So, what is there here with the, so what we do here, uh, we deposit platinum on the center, right, of this small specimen and try to take the desired very thin uh, material in the unit of micrometer. We are not destroying anything of the bulk, right? So this is the top reason, right? And you see here, uh, this is how your sample looks like before people take it out lot of, uh, they try to make it very thin before they take out from the sample. So this procedure is extremely important to make it thin. Why it is important? Because you are putting your needle here. So there would be a needle that would be coming here and attaching your material to it. This would be a platinum needle that you would bring. And then you would start making a trench here and it gets separated. Now, why you have to make it very thin not extremely thin. So you have to see right now, it should be around 250 nanometer at least. And when you put it on the needle, then you do a final thinning and that would reduce the material to 100 nanometer. Right? So why at this stage you are doing 250 nanometer while it is still attached to needle? Because needle has a very, a weld that can break right? Less the material, you would be more stable, right? If it is thick, there's a chances that material would, you know, dissociate from the needle. Yeah? Do I make sense here? So this is what uh, is some of the key things that you would, you know, keep in mind. Um, rest, I would, you know, detail them again during your um, practical. Now, First thing that is important here is U-centric height adjustments. So U-centric height adjustment is, uh, is something. So you see here, you have FIB gun, you have SEM. So you are looking to one gun on your sample, but you're aligning it with respect to another gun and want to operate the entire operation through another gun, right? So here is your sample and your material you are, you know, trying to use FIB gun. So U-centric is extremely important and U-centric height is typically around five millimeter in most FIB. So the distance that you see is five millimeter. Everything is very, uh, how to say, extremely delicate inside the microscopes. That's why it keeps on breaking because we have multiple users, the entire university uses it, people break it. So there's a reason 
why we approach this condition that the microscope is not working for another week. So we try to be very careful when we take out FIB, we, we take, we, you know, we back the gun very, very carefully. And um, this, this is an important distance that you will keep in mind while operating it. And this is important because both FIB and SCM are looking at the same, um, same uh, zone. So you're using two guns to look at the same zone. The gun that is looking is also milling at the same time. That's why you're able to have the entire view. So this is how inside the microscope it looks like. This is your sample. It is tilted right now. On top is your, uh, is your uh, gun. So this is your gun on top here. And this one is your sample holder here. And this is your needle that you would see, right? Platinum needle that would come. And this would be some, some lenses and also some G, uh, other parts of GIS maybe. Um, this is the exact thing that you look at it. So you see that needle is inserted right now that I was asking you, that I was showing you in the past. But you needle is connected to your sample. So this is what you see from your naked eyes. But in the microscope, there's a different view that you see, right? So there's some notes on platinum. Um, why do uh, last class I told you why do we use platinum? Is to protect the material. What other what other approaches I told you that we do? We use carbon marker. So now uh, here it's um, the repetition. I think I, I have repeated it. So simply the trenches are created around the area of interest and you see the milling by SCM beam and sample is cut like this into in the form of two rectangle after depositing the platinum, right? And this is something uh, they have given a little explanation. Um, how is the gas molecules are absorbed and interact? So now this is something. Uh, you see on, on screen two things. When I go in the microscope, there are multiple screens open. One of the screen is electron beam image. That would be a normal view that you see in SEM of the everything. Another view is you see an ion beam image where platinum is deposited, right? And this is the view that you see. And this is how it works. You simply, you know, by creating a box here, you simply do ion milling. And you select the box, and then you start playing with the energy here in this table here. You create a groove like this on one side, and you can tilt it to see in various directions. This is, uh, you see that different uh, views are shown to you. This is here, one of them is electron, uh, electron beam view. Other, other, the other is your um, ion imaging. And this is your view that you have third one. That is a camera that is just telling you the position. And this is where a U-centric height concept that I told you is extremely important. Everything can, you know, collide into each other if you don't pay enough attention, right? Till here, this procedure is very simple. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it with a single training. Now, where does it become complicated? It's a step two. That would be your lab two of FIB. Everyone can do it. I present to you today. You would be able to do it tomorrow. You just have to put platinum, just have to create grooves, make them smooth. Here is the main challenge. When you bring this needle in, the weld gets everything. 90% of the time, welding is not done, and students, they try to you know, pull out the needle much before. Or your platinum is missing, it's not enough deposited, and the weld is very weak. That's because there's not enough gas. Other than that, there could be other factors. What other factors could be there? If you did not do this trench here nicely, it is still connected. 
So you are trying to pull the material from here, but it is still connected. What would happen? An accident, which happens every day. In that thing, simply either your this weld breaks, or you have a sample because there's an extra force to it, it breaks and just falls in the chamber. And here is the extreme precaution that we need to, to do like the real challenge or the delicate steps. Now, this is a kind of a, a grid that you will have. And this grid, uh, you would simply weld it. Please review this online lecture before coming to the lab, you know, so that it's easy, steps are easy and easy for me to, to uh, teach you. So this is a kind of grid that we will put the sample holder. And this grid has got A, B, C. For some experiments, high-level experiments, what we do, we, a single grid can have multiple FIB. But for you as a beginner, what is the disadvantage? If you somehow drop the grid, you can lose all the FIB sample. So in the time you come to my level, you know, years of experience, you just put one sample per, per grid. But then you become advanced because for us, during a single microscopy session, it is very easy to see all the samples. So when you become advanced, but not, not right now, right? Don't do it. Now, so you can use A, B, C as a marker, try to choose your space and try to put your sample that was connected to the needle now has been welded to the grid. How would you weld it? Another platinum weld there, right? So finally, your sample looks like this. You have a grid and a very thin slice which is 20 micrometer in depth, generally, depend on the need, you know, and you have a platinum on top, and this is your weld. And this was your grid, a highly zoomed view that you see on the screen that was presented in the last. Okay, now I would continue with real TEM. Any questions, anyone? I think yeah, you create those two big groups. Generally, 90% of the time, you just start milling it afterwards because it is connected very strongly on the side. So you don't care. 20 micrometers strong connection is there. So you can literally clear out the bottom reading. Yeah. And I would again encourage you, not stop learning microscopy ever if you are into material science or or a nuclear engineer. It is like a star to your profile. I was very disheartened to hear a lot of students they dropped out because it's challenging. It consumes time. People offer another easy techniques like XRD or hardness or whatever. But here is the someone you know who knows it. They all have you know fabulous jobs because this is very uh, how to say it's a skill that comes with time and patience and people lose it. But once it comes, uh, then you are the most important person in the community because you can do it all. Because you have seen the defects in your material by your, you know, you can, you have your own control over everything. You are not dependent on any other technique. And one thing is that this is one of the direct technique to see the defects. Sardi, Raman, everything, they are indirect techniques. Direct technique means you do with a wave different sort of energy. What you get is some kind of results that you interpret. Here you don't interpret. What you see is what, what is there. Okay? There's no interpretation required. So I would not, it would become tough, but have yourself individually, right now, I don't know which years you are, have yourself um, enrolled with the Neil uh, Evans and Gerd Dusher that you want to learn microscopy and FIV and they will arrange sessions for you as required. And then it's up to you to build up gradually. Every week, just take one session, go spend time on microscope. But leaving. Um, so this is the general layout of the microscope. Now, first number one thing that we are going to learn in the microscope is about the alignment of the microscope. That's why it is important for me to that you understand the term of each lens and how each lens is behaving in creating 
final image using microscope. So this is a general layout. This is a layout of the microscope that I learned in my thesis. And these days, we have become more automatic in alignment, um, like the one we have at Jaim, uh, pretty automatic. Uh, but I think this is important from learning point of view to know how each lens is behaving, because even if it is automatic, there's a problem that you have to go back and reflect where could be the problem in the beam. So I would go through each uh, each of the lenses and the function of it. So this is how the PM looks like. It is digital 2000 FX. I learned uh, during my PhD in France, and also it is available here at Oak Ridge National Lab, one of my favorite uh, toy here. I love uh, doing experiments on this one because uh, it comes very naturally to me. Now, here, what do you see? There are condenser. Uh, so I think I explained to you in the last class that we have three systems. One is your condenser alignment. Other is your objective lens alignment. And then final is your uh, where from where you take the image. There are three uh, categories that it is divided into. And all of these categories, basically, they are different lenses. They are doing different things for you. And you have to align them along the optical axis to get a final good image, right? Uh, so I will go with them one by one. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so you, you will put your sample holder is here. The sample that you will prepare by FIV, you will put it in the sample holder. And the sample holder can be rotated. And you will have a footstep here that you can rotate your sample. And it is important to tilt your sample because you want to go at different zones in your sample. And you start rotating it by here. And then you can you move your sample x, y, z, all you do it with this footstep here. And you can do it. And then after putting your sample, what are you worrying about? You have a sample, now what do you need? It's electron beam. So you would go and on the source. And once you're on the source, you have to now see that your source is aligned. And after, here is your source. And you, you will see that you see the gun, but you don't see the gun in the center of the screen because different samples are not aligned. Now here you will have condenser. In the beginning, you have three lenses of the condenser. I'll go uh, one by one on the use of uh, each one of them. And then you will have objective lens here. And then you will finally have all the system to look at it, the projection system, what you call. Overall, this is a general overview. I think I have talked about diffraction, but I will start using these two terms again and again. It could also give you a homework um, about these ray diagrams so that you know what you're doing when you're in the microscope, what is happening. So in generally, uh, in this diagram, we have, you know, there's an electron gun. Then there's a condenser lens. Then there's a condenser aperture. Together, we call them condenser system. But in this diagram, there is only one lens shown of the condenser. Normally, we have three condensers. What is the function of condenser? Basically, the function of condenser is to bring your electron beam, which is produced by the electron gun on the sample somehow, because they are magnetic lens beam is in all directions. Then we have a specimen. Now, a simple ray diagram that I discussed in the beginning of the last class, which was very easy, right? You have objective lens, you have a specimen that you insert through the object holder, and you try to get, this is the focal plane. Remember where you, you were playing with the focal image and playing with the magnification in the last class? And now what happens is that you, can either, you know, this one is here's the image plane. Normally, you can, you know, at the image plane here, you can do two things. Now, please pay attention here. There is one button in the microscope. With this one button that is in the microscope, 
you can either look at the imaging mode that is the image directly versus you can choose another button that is d d that is here would take you into the diffraction mode so electron when it passes through the sample it is two things happening most of the light is passing through the center of your material it's a transmitted light another one that interests to most of us is a diffracted beam which carries all the information about your sample whether it is silicon or aluminum or whatever it is because of the planes so this particular thing because it's electron beam you have both the rays at the same time after it passes through your objective it has both both the image now it's up to you what you want to look at if you want to look at the image here so this one here so you will create in this case if i do not take your you know your uh, image further you will create an image here because this is a image plane instead you can also this would be the imaging mode in the diffraction mode if you see d you will see what you will see is some kind of diffraction spots i have in the next image so you can choose and this is where is the main step and then after that in the normal case what happens is you have intermediate lens the function of the intermediate lens is whatever the image is created here normally we don't see it would be at the same magnification right there is only one lens here or slightly high you know slightly magnified therefore there is another system which is intermediate lens system where this image was created here and now it is acting as an as the object for this lens here and it is getting magnified into a further to a further lens so as you increase the number of lenses you are actually increasing your magnification in the simpler case your entire system could be till here it could be till here your entire system you would be happy with but generally we need very very high magnification therefore we need a huh? special lens that is an intermediate lens right and it's up to you what you want to do you want to just take you know your image put it on the microscope and do a bright field image i would come to all these classic terms bright field dark field transmitted beam diffracted beam as we proceed and i think this is one of the really very important lecture for you if you start operating microscope i try to work hard on this one now in some microscopes you have even multiple lenses because more lens lenses you have more magnification you can create so ultimately we are able to break this thing into one thing is your condenser here right another one is your intermediate lens your objective thing here that comes right this is your condenser sorry this is your objective and then there is a projector thing so these are the main three things that you align what you want that all the things should come to the center of this optical axis right make sense and you choose a button called d to simply say i don't want you know to view through this light which is transmitted versus i want to use something that is called diffracted light that i want to choose Do you see the pointer on screen when I move now? Yeah. Even if I use a very dark color, don't see. Oh, this is something I wasn't expecting, but okay. Right. Yeah. So this is what is. I'm doing actually. I'm punching a pointer, but I have to constantly switch. No. Yeah, yeah. Pointer you can choose, but then I have to press three keys. I don't know how can you switch back between pointer and 
Yeah, this is a good question. Maybe I'll cross check uh, today. Um, so this is what you are doing. Ultimately, condenser, your objective lens alignment, and this thing. Now we go step by step, more details. This is um, how complex it looks in the manual, the TM. So as you work in the lab, you will be given this manual. And you should know what we are doing. So he divided it into four. We also have electron gun along with the three systems that I explained to you in the previous slide. And this is how the entire microscope looks like. Now, most of the things you would know by now, but I would like to emphasize on each one in detail. And trust me, this is the diagram that you would be looking at when you will go on the microscope. Those three one, two, and three from the different classes and setting quotes is what they're yeah. So here on the screen, what you see is depending upon the microscope, but in general, in most of the microscope that you see, we have three condenser lenses. What is the idea of the condenser lens that we could do? So the entire three or four slides that are coming up, they are all about condenser system. In the condenser system, okay, you have a source and a well net cup and a gun deflectors that controls your gun and the direction of your gun. Now, once you are here, you cannot change the, the amount of electrons that are falling into your sample by changing the gun. What you do is you do it through condenser. In the condenser, each lens plays a different role. First is the role of a spot size. Spot size, it generally tells you the one, there are generally one to nine spot size and that you can choose while aligning your microscope. The spot size one is basically where you have the highest or the largest spot or the largest amount of electrons that you're allowed to pass. Spot nine, spot nine is the smallest, so it goes in the opposite direction, the numbering in the most of the microscopes. Generally, this is uh, the, the microscope philosophy that I'm teaching, but as the technology is improving, we have subtle changes in some of the microscopes. So we, when we go, we open the alignment, but overall, this is how the entire system is. So you have to check once you, with your lab, lab person, you know, what, what does it exactly have? Because GeoL has this, um, I know uh, Zeiss has something different uh, and Helio something else. Now C2 controls the brightness. So all these condenser system, they are controlling the brightness of uh, spot size or the brightness of your uh, beam. How bright is your beam, right? So you can control it using C2 lens. Yes, the question. Yes, there's a big difference. So a spot size generally, uh, it would tell you the area of illumination. So for some uh, things, you would need a very small spot size because you are really, you are doing convergent beam kind of analysis that you want to highly focus it. And for some things you want a bigger spot size because you are looking at a universal sample or a bigger area, depending on your need. Brightness is simply as similar to you understand by any, any lamp. It's more bright or less bright. You play with the brightness knob. And everything has a button or knob. All these terms here, they have a brightness or a knob that you can play with. And you literally have those buttons there that you go and play with, right? And then for some things, you do convergence. For some kind of high resolution microscopy, what you do, you want a very narrow beam, like you know, a laser pointer beam. So you use a convergence. And all these three things, they together form a condenser system. Then we have aperture. Aperture is further simply a plate of metal with three holes, depending upon how smaller you want the beam and you really want to select or a bigger one. And together, 
with stigmators that I discussed last time, you form a condenser system, right? Now, this is condenser system here. Uh, this is what uh, summarized here, what I presented in the previous slide. What is the goal? To place the beam on the sample. Yes, the question. Right, right now I haven't come to the sample yet. I'm coming to this very slowly. Uh, I'm still on the, uh, I'm still on, on the, yeah. So I'm still on the condenser system. In the objective one, you have a sample and there is an objective lens. And this is your sample and there is aperture. Yeah, you can have it multiple objective lens as well in some of them. Right now they have shown you two lenses here in this diagram. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is objective aperture and objective lens. So normally there should be one lens. That is generally shown that condenser has three lenses. Objective has just one lens and then you have it. So he it's just showing the top and the upper part. It's basically the aperture here. He's just trying to show it to you show you the object, objective lens, yeah. So generally one objective lens, three, convert, three condenser lenses and intermediate system, how much magnification you need, right? You can choose you know, number of lenses depending upon, depending on your microscope, right? Now, what is the main uh, goal of condenser? To place the beam on the sample. Then what you can play with? You can play with the probe size. You can play with the con convergence angle and you can play with the intensity. Now probe size. What do you understand by probe size is the spot size? The same beam, I can make it very thin. Same beam, I can make it very big, right? So what I'm doing, if I'm making it very small, I'm condensing all electron in a smaller area versus when it is broad, I can, I can put it into a bigger area. At the same time, when it is in the smaller area, I can play with the brightness, right? Within the smaller area itself, I can, you know, illuminate it very strong or illuminate it very weak, right? Make sense? Convergence angle is how focused you want, right? All of these three things have buttons on them. You would play with it manually, right? Now, other things that we do is, Parallel illumination. So now the diagram that you see were very simple. Now you would uh, start confusing that how the beam has become parallel. So there's a principle called Kohler principle. In this way, there is a, a particular way in which you can literally have a parallel illumination. So what will happen is that from here that you see uh, that the beams are in a very, you know, from the objective lens when the beam falls, it will fall in a way, in a parallel way. So I, I would not, I don't think so for microscopy, only important term is that you can have a parallel illumination. That is the main thing that you should remember because it will get very intense if I get into the details how the lens are doing it. Other thing you know is focused illumination that I've been talking about with the convergence lens. We can do convergent beam diffraction we can do EDS, yields, and micro diffraction if the beam is very convergent. Now, what is EDS, yields? Just, uh, I would like to know that this, these terms would come again and again. You should at least have an idea. If anyone tells you that, have you done EDS on your material? Or have you done yields on your material? Or micro diffraction? <laughs> diffraction that you know, we all know XRD, we all know Bragg's law and lambda is equals to 2D sine theta. Now, when you have this Bragg's law, you have an entire bigger sample piece from which your electron beam is passing and you are getting a diffracted beam versus what you're getting is a parallel beam, the transmitted beam, most of the light that passes, right? Now, for micro diffraction, what happens? Let me draw a very quick cartoon for you here. Now, this is your sample here, right? So I just draw a 3D, I like to draw it. 
this is your electron beam passing most of the beam would pass that is your transmitted beam then when your beam what happens is it meets certain planes right it has a plane center it right which is separated by a distance of d what is a d lattice spacing right then what happens is you see a diffracted beam which 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 is like this right this is a diffracted beam so this everything right now so you will have a transmitted versus diffracted now this diffracted beam it carries the signature of your entire crystal microscopy and electron microscope is a unique instrument that you have where you can choose either transmitted or diffracted there is no other technique currently with which you can do that and this diffracted beam is what makes it very unique in your optical microscope everywhere diffraction is happening but you cannot choose it and this tells you you know the most important behavior of your material in terms of defects now here is the main thing this where you use transmitted beam you know you, you call it as a bright field imaging be careful on the terms i would say always go through this lecture again and this one is dark beam dark field image and in this as well you will go with weak weak beam dark field the dark field is something that you take a diffracted spot now weak beam dark field would be something that you will start taking a diffracted spot which is of higher order right so i will go through this so this is here now here comes the term micro diffraction there where i started this discussion with right i only hope the lecture is getting recorded if it is not be upset um uh here it's it is but i want to record it on the zoom yeah next time maybe i will ask one of you to do a redundant recording for me you just sign up on my thing and just have it recorded mm -hmm. that i have it because last time i lost if you go on the lecture 2 i lost the second half of the recording and microscopy and plus i would be dealing with ml plus your labs it's, it's lot to keep in your mind and most important application as a scientist would be to to know the practical application so you know now here you have eds and eels eds is something that is where you are it's electron electron dispersive spectroscopy where you would know about the element of the of your sample different eds eds is basically you are uh, studying the it's it's a behavior where you are knowing the elemental uh, you know the elemental knowledge of your material whether it is silicon aluminum or you know phosphorus or carbon oxygen what is present eels i think i already discussed with you very important electron energy uh, loss spectroscopy one of the main um, uses that you can use it to find the sample thickness right i will definitely like to cover eels with you uh, and how to do it then we have something called convergent beam diffraction where you will converge your beam and start playing and then another last thing that we do is um, we can use you know bright field dark field i explained to you and then we can use scanning transmission electron microscopy all these techniques they are they would be told to you as an overview and it's not important for your career i don't do many still because i never needed it but some of them like bright field dark field eels eds these are classic that you would know in any case right but other than that i i, I never thought that i used you know i used stem very late in my career very very late like 6 years after learning microscopy now is something we talk about parallel beam we are again on the condenser the some ray diagrams could be as your homework as i discussed 
Do you mind signing up on Zoom for me, one of you guys? And just press the record button. The last time it didn't get record for some reason. Yes. Oh, I think we will restart this again. Now, if you have your this small sample, you can you want the same information of this small sample. I I wish I can use TEM. Um, I can use your PDF <coughs> on SEM on TEM sample. Use you know what I'm saying. But to get the EM sample inside, but you cannot. The distribution is so poor. It doesn't go to the nanometer range. The detectors are same. Everything is same. But you will put a bulk sample in SEM versus in TEM, uh, you will use your 200 mic 220 micrometer sample. Yeah. yeah. Magnification, resolution, magnification, both. Both. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's recording? Great. Thanks, guys. Um, now, here it's important. That's why I wanted a double recording of this. Go ahead. Because last time, I don't know. If you go to the lecture second recording, there is no recording. The first one, I never played on Zoom, so it wasn't there. Um, yeah, every time I'm doing um, these videos, which I convert, finally I learn something. You know. Uh, okay, now record. Okay, let's just then. Okay. Normally, this is a Zoom from office uh, from UT. So we anticipate that a lot of users can record the screen. That should be the kind of arrangement on uh, its educational Zoom. No, no, not to you. Not to you oh, just yeah. generally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's okay. It's okay. If it doesn't get recorded, you're bad luck, guys. <laughs> okay. So, if just to tell you what I'm talking about, look at this uh, diagram here. Now, in this diagram, do you see one thing? that your light, it is passing through a condenser system, right? Normally, whenever it passes through a lens, it should definitely be bending, right? That's the classical thing that we learned because it has certain focus to it. But in most of the cases, what you see is already, it's a parallel illumination on your specimen because it is easy to work. So the principle that I told you is about the Kohler's, uh, Kohler's principle that happens here. So when you draw this, anything where in, the, in any lenses that where your light is passing or your, sorry, electrons are passing, you see them bending, right? But in this one, it's falling parallel. So this is a parallel illumination or a Kohler 
Kohler on the basis of Kohler principle, which is already shown to you. I'm not, right now I'm highlighting it. So do not feel that what is the difference between this diagram and the one that I'm showing you here. Simply, it's a C1 lens, that's a crossover. That would just tell you about your uh, spot size and everything. I will come, come here in a minute. And then uh, through this lens, what you're doing, you're creating a beam that is parallel. And anyone interested, just Google Kohler principle, but it just uh, makes, be, makes your illumination parallel. Or come to my office for details. Now, we see how um, is your spot size created? Ray diagrams, ray diagrams are important, could be a question. Right now, what do you see on the screen? Is a weaker crossover. And then it's the same ray diagram. And now I make it a stronger crossover. What do you see? in which case there is more light falling on your lens in first case versus second case. This is how you choose. Uh, so here your focus is slightly weaker. And in this one, your focus is slightly stronger. So you are simply changing the crossover uh, position by changing the focus of your lens in both the cases. I have just presented an example of a weaker crossover versus a stronger crossover. And this is how the, your spot size is controlled. So in this case, what is happening here? You see an angle which is very broad versus in this case, you see an angle which is very narrow. If the angle is narrow, that means you will have more, more illumination here, more intense here versus here, right? It's a broader angle. So that is how your spot size is controlled. Make sense? Right? In this one, you will have a bigger, bigger spot size versus a smaller spot size. Hmm? Make sense, guys? This is how you control spot size. Now it will go through your aperture. Aperture is another, uh, another thing. Now people can ask that when you can control the spot size, what is the need of aperture? Can anyone answer this question? Right. Um, yeah, he, he said that we are bringing it closer to the optical axis. But you have to see one thing. Even if the spot size is very bigger, one. If I go to the previous slide, here, if the spot size is very bigger, in this case, I just want to see a smaller part without changing my alignment, which is having everything close to the optical axis. Plus, I want to see only one area. I will have this first insert, right? Not, not going to the smaller spot size. Spot size is smaller to bigger. You're literally playing with your beam intensity, right? If it's a very small, narrow spot size, you are doing it for a purpose. Maybe you're doing some micro kind of analysis. If it's a bigger one, you are doing it for another purpose. But in this bigger one as well, you can need a pressure to select a different you know, part of your, here it would be beam because you want to block most of the light. Now, I think I went to this one. Now is the your parallel illumination thing. They are using again spot size brightness. So your spot size is created through a C1. Brightness is controlled to C2. And then in the third one is your parallel illumination happening where you are putting your specimen before the specimen, just before the specimen, you will have a button where you can you know, either activate or deactivate. For some purposes, we have a special lens where you can also play with the convergence of the beam here, depending on your need. But this is the general uh, schematics that we have. After parallel illumination also, you can always choose an aperture. Aperture is there at multiple levels. Normally we don't insert apertures at every step. We let it be beam 
that is coming from the column. But at certain cases, you use it because it changes the convergence angle. So you can play with it in a different way. Now, here they have shown you an example of a parallel illumination versus a conversion uh, versus a focus probe, right? You think you can draw these ray diagrams if given, a, if given in your homework? Now, this one uh, is even more uh, particular now. We have a focus probe, we have a focus probe, and then we have a convergent beam focus probe. And we can play with this, all these things before putting on the sample. Yes, that's what we need. We want to play with the beam before putting it on the sample. This is your sample here. Depending upon what kind of analysis you are doing, right? Now, can anyone explain to me the difference with the ray diagram here? What is happening? Just to terminate the condenser part, I think. Yeah. What do you think? Go ahead, look at it. What, what do we see here? Like till we one crossover, same, pretty much. Then we have a C2 lens. In, in the in the C2 lens, you think is a is a higher magnification. And here are the C2 lenses off. We are not using C2 lens. We have made it off. So when you make it off, when you make it off, so you do not every time the tendency of the lens is to bend your rays and to bring it into focus. And if you're off the C2 lens, then you let it pass through the aperture. And finally, you have upper pole of the objective lens. That was something that, you know, you mentioned it's the upper pole of the objective lens. And you're putting it between upper pole and the lower pole somehow. It's one objective. Guys, somebody has to explain it just for me. For conversion beam focus, you do not control any other brightness. That's the one information that we could take. It is showing you a very high conversion beam. Very, very high conversion beam. So if you if you make C2 lens off, that means you are you are making your brightness lens off, and you let everything pass after choosing or I think a spot size, and you let it pass through the objective, and it is focusing it. Versus in another case, you let almost the parallel illumination all in here. So basically, when you have a C2 lens, you are have a parallel illumination or a less convergent illumination on, versus in this case, you can literally, you know, have a very high convergent beam. Right. Now we go through scanning and tilting and translating of the beam. This is very important when you do diffraction studies. If you are looking at the sample, you have because you have the luxury also in the diffracted beam is always produced at an angle. You have a luxury to just see it in front of your eyes by tilting the beam. And these all these things are done through your deflectors. So you can you have a beam coming. Okay, it's got diffracted. I can just you know tilt it or translate it to wherever I want. I can play. So overall, what I want to say is from a single electron beam, you have a translated, you have a transmitted beam from which you will do bright field. You have a diffracted beam from which you will do dark field. But you are here, so dark field is here. You can bring it as you want in front of you. Right? And this is all done by your deflectors, right? That we had in the 
here and this one here. Gun deflectors. Hmm? Make sense? Yeah. yeah. This one? This one here? Uh, what is the question? Generally, it's one objective lens. They put it the top pole. Yeah, upper pole of the objective lens. So they say front, uh, this is front focal point of the objective lens, C3 lens. So basically they are, uh, basically you can say it is the upper pole of the objective lens. Maybe they're interchangeable or they're saying dedicated C3 for the parallel illumination. I think nowadays it's more modern in the past. You were able to, you know, if you are not using C3, then you can simply, uh, on the position of it, you if upper pole you are using in front of, in, in, instead of C3. But generally, we always use C3. Uh, in my, I, I never recall that I never had parallel illumination, only in some cases when I was doing uh, PDS. Okay. This is again from the manual about the condenser system, C1, C2, and C3, a large part. We have an aperture in between here. Then we have an objective lens. And then we have a specimen. I think this is the right of the pre-field. This is the entire objective lens, ultimately. So this entire objective lens is consist of your upper and bottom and you're putting specimen in, in between poles. But again, this is too much into detail, maybe not so important. Right. Uh, now I would go on the very important part. Till now, one year uh, after I have talked to my students in the, in the past class, they, uh, you saw the reaction in the meeting that none of them were trained because uh, they don't understand uh, very simple things. What is bright field? What is dark field? What is high resolution microscopy? And once you know these terms, uh, you would know most of it. Then you would should know how to form the diffraction patterns, right? We recall this diagram from the first class. Now we have come to objective and imaging system. We have moved from condenser to objective. Now we start talking about objective lens. Objective lens is one of the most important lens for you guys. Once you are done with the condenser, you forget about it. When you do the experiments, you play with the objective all the time. So when you talk about objective, we would not talk about upper pole and lower pole. We consider in our mind one convex lens like this, it's easy for the purpose of understanding. So you have one convex lens, you have the object plane where your object is inserted through your sample holder. And then you have the two main things. One is the back focal plane and another is the image plane. I would be talking about the back focal plane again and again and again. Why I would talk about back focal plane again and again. This is a place where you would choose your diffracted beam versus your transmitted beam. So you have your sample. There was a beam coming to it. You were able to a beam, your sample, and now all these electron beam, it carries the characteristics of your characteristics of your sample. It carries the information about the transmitted beam. It carries the information about the diffracted beam because it has already passed. Now you are putting an objective lens. What it will do? It will magnify whatever you, 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 you know, it will focus it 
magnify it, whatever you want. It will also do the same thing with the diffraction pattern. Why not? You can magnify, you can shrink your diffraction pattern. And it's a back focal plane here where you choose, where you put an aperture. If you want, I choose a diffracted beam. If you want, I would choose a transmitted beam, right? And would do my analysis here. So this is a back focal plane, which is most important. And we are, would be on time in five minutes. I was slow today, but I wanted to emphasize on this. I was very slow and I would be slow again in the next lecture. Once this is thorough to you, you should be able to think, hey, this is the diffraction pattern we are formed. And then I will start going into diffraction pattern and then the real problems. So, right, let's quickly see what is in the notes. We should have an optimum position of the sample. When you put your sample, what you can do? Tell me, can you move? So there are two things you can play with. Once you put your sample, you can play with the object. I can, if I change the position of the object plane, can I change my magnification? V, U, F. I would change my U, position of U, where is your sample? Can I change it? Yes, I can. I can tilt it. Once I insert it, there's a goniometer attached, right? And with that goniometer, I'm able to control my object. I can make it up, down, side or left, depending upon whatever I want to see, right? So you have to remember this is microscopy. Everything we are doing at a distance of streets, there was a big translation happening. You would see, hey, only put my sample where it's two and a person, and I don't see it down from my eyes. See, it's very minute, right? Other thing you can change is if you have changed, you can change your position of the focus by playing with the current on the lens. So, by changing both these things, you can play with the magnification depending on your convenience. So it's you, right? So, in older microscopes, you set the microscope lens strength to make it coincide with the object. In the newer system, the physical location is known, yielding a fixed objective lens current. This is better, no need to change lens current during imaging, greater stability. So in the, in the previous system, so I just told you that either you can change this or this. In the previous system, we were literally changing this by playing with the current uh, on the objective lens. And we were playing with everything. Now we keep this fixed. We play more with the object. It's easy. We tilt with our foot, foot the object. We change the manual to create a better focus. So you centric height means. My object, my history of changing the lens, change the problem that we have here, to change the problem, right? Depending upon the need, generally we never touch the magnification. Just try to keep it very much easy. What is manual is just keep on changing your sample. And try to see. So there's a button, Z, Z button, Z button. So Z button basically what it does, the Z button, Z button, it simply brings your sample holder a position that every everything that you see is in the focus zone. This is a first alignment procedure that you do. After doing the condenser alignment, what you're doing is a U-centric height. Eucentric height is to bring your sample at a position where you see a focused image. This can be done by two time, two things. One, by changing the position of your sample, other is the focus. Position of the sample has to put to zero if you want to start your experiment and then change the objective lens only once. 
that means you have set your condition for the experiment. Don't manipulate it again and again. Then when you start doing your experiment, you see that everything has become out of focus. Why? What has changed? You have moved your sample. That's why. Because you're constantly moving your sample when you have the microscope. There's a Z knob, XY, XY knob. You're moving it here, there, everywhere. When you create FIB, sometimes your sample is homogeneously thin at certain places, then suddenly it becomes thick. Now again, I'm not talking in terms of millimeters, I'm talking in terms of nanometers. So start thinking in that way. So you're going from a very thin zone to suddenly thick zone. Now suddenly you have come to a very thick sample. What do you see? It's blurred. Why my image is not clear now? Or what do you do? Maybe you are still enough thin that you're electron transparent that you can see your sample. But what you have to do now, to, if you're in a thicker zone, then, okay, go back at Z, at your Z height, where your sample is, and play with that. Make sense what I'm trying to say here, guys? This is key concepts. Like once you would be in the lab, you will find it, you know, very annoying that suddenly you were doing absolutely brilliant, lining it, suddenly everything is blurred. First key thing that you do, do not change the alignment, look at the eucentric height, right? I'm emphasizing it because this is very important. Like this is the crux. Okay, guys, let us do it in the next class now after this because it's becoming more complicated. <laughs>